Good evening and welcome to this, the second of five conversations um, that we're hosting on behalf of Architecture at the Edge, uh, Galway's Festival of Architecture. My name is uh, Niall Maxwell from Royal Office for Architecture and uh, we are involved in um, having a conversation with Galway uh, in this year of their festival called Boundaries. Um, a festival that discusses to the life of living in West of Ireland, surrounded by boundaries, structures, infrastructures, the coastline, field boundaries, and looking around the West of Ireland and everywhere, you will see the architectural memories and morphology of design, um, past and present, and of our place in society. And our interest tonight really is about the frameworks, the systems, and the environments that we all inhabit and enmesh us together. The festival happened in October, of course, in the early part of the, uh, the month, a mixture of online events and uh, installations and conversations. And um, we decided that actually we're gonna hang around for a few weeks over the lockdown to extend this conversation, to start looking at what the possibilities are for Galway in 2021 and the potential to host a summer school in the city and what, entail, what is entailed with that process. Um, so the starting point really is to look at the, uh, the mission of the festival, which really can be summarized um, by their own um, press output, which describes creating a platform to empower a learned society, making architecture more accessible, promoting design, best practice and sustainable development, improving the perception of architecture and of the architect locally and internationally, and of course, helping to shape the quality of the built environment pretty much our role as professionals, but also our role really in terms of engaging with communities. But this summer school really needs some thought into terms of what we are actually doing that for, what type of activities would be taking place, what type of engagement would happen and what we would learn from the process and who we would be communicating to and what we're trying to achieve from this uh, vision for 2021. Mm -hmm. Last, um, last conversation, which is obviously earlier in October, we were talking to three practitioners who were uh, existing in very different fields, but actually had a kind of connection together. The first was Tom Keeley, who, who runs a, a, a travel agency with no holidays called Keeley Travel, and has actually just relocated to Cork in Ireland from his base in London, where he's studying his PhD at the Bartlett, and to Fiona MacDonald, who is... Um, uh, one half of Matt and Fiona, a participatory uh, process of design for young people. And then Owen Griffiths, who's based in Wales, uh, who runs a practice called Ways of Working, very much working with communities at a grassroots level, no pun intended, with growing platforms, learning how to engage through food and, um, and growing and gardening. And I think the interesting thing that came out of the conversation in that week was that um, things are never straightforward. I think not every project starts at the beginning with something that somebody said and that you need to be careful really about the balance of expectation and delivery when starting to look at any form of participatory process. Understanding context is of course critical but being embedded is probably more so. Owen talked about working from the edges of communities or from systems and Fee was talking about always needing to expect the pitfalls and failures of any progress. In fact, she rather beautifully explained how uh, there's always a moment when one of you is crying in the middle of a, in the middle of a project. And then Tom, of course, threw the curveball in by actually asking, do we really need a summer school? And I suppose that's a, a more of a, a philosophical question, but actually starts to ask what type of legacy and what measure of success do we find within uh, any form of engagement strategy. So this week is um, an opportunity really maybe to start to focus on participatory techniques. In other words, how do we go about engaging? Who do we talk to? What are the systems or the techniques or processes that we could use? So here to join me uh, on this is, um, is, is Daisy Fruit. Uh, strategist specialising in community engagement and participatory design with a particular focus on collaborative and deliberative decision making. 
having started her career in environmental campaigning and community-led regeneration from 2003 to 2014. Data was actually a founding director of architecture practice AOC, even though she isn't an architect, and was shortlisted for the Emerging Women's uh, Architect of the Year Award in 2014. I love this photograph, by the way, Daisy. It's sort of, uh, it's very monumental. She's also a teaching fellow at the Bartlett School of Architecture, where she lectures on the history and theory of spatial politics. And uh, she's also a mayoral design advocate advising on community engagement to the mayor of London. Daisy is, um, is joined by Mari, uh, Dr. Mari McVicker, an academic at the Welsh School of Architecture, Cardiff. She joined uh, uh, Welsh School in 2006, following practice in the US and UK. And she teaches across both undergrad and postgrad courses, as well as being the author of the recently published Precision in Architecture, Certain Certainty, Ambiguity and Deviation. Excuse me, I keep getting all of these little indications on my screen. But the interesting thing about Mari is with her other hat, she's, um, she's the university's award-winning project leader, Community Gateway, where she oversees a community university engagement platform, facilitating over 50 partnership projects within the city, including this, the 1.6 million community-led partnership redevelopment of a vacant bowls pavilion in Grangetown. This being the recently completed facilities designed by Benham Architects in Cardiff. Mari and uh, Daisy are joined and we're really, really pleased to, uh, to have Sebastio de Botton with us tonight. He's the co-founder of the Architecture and Art Collective Collective a Warehouse based in Lisbon, Portugal. Established in 2013, they are on a progressive search to define what architecture is nowadays and what role the architect should play in society. They operate through design, experimentation, mediation, civic participation and collaboration, as well as through practical intervention, often designing their own buildings. This hands-on approach cuts across all of their work as they believe that by being multidisciplinary and co-creating, it's possible to achieve better results. Well, that's my blurb to get us started. It's great to welcome you all. Sebastio, thanks so much for joining us all the way from Lisbon. Good evening. You need to take yourself off mute if you can. Are you there? I'm sorry because I, I did share the screen before unmuting. And That's I was okay, don't worry, don't worry. There's no and I, and I was in full screen. So That's okay. And uh, Mari, are you in Cardiff tonight? Yes, I am. Good. And and Daisy, where are you? Are you in London? Uh, London, Bethnal Green, East London. Great, great. And what I like about this is that actually it's so great to be able to sort of spread the geographical um, audience as much as uh, participants. It's one of those democratising processes that lockdown has provided us all with, I suppose. Um, Sebastian, do you want to maybe get us started by, um, by, by talking about really how you got, how you got started in practice? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to, to be here tonight and sharing some ideas and projects. I'm really, uh, um, well, I'm really excited to, to get to know a little bit more about your practices and, and how you've been able to, to do uh, projects with engagement and participation over uh, these geographical differences. So uh, first of all, I'd like to, to start a little bit with context and what is Warehouse and how did it start? And actually it started as a group of students and uh, we formed a collective that didn't know what architecture was going to, to do and to practice. But then luckily we, we met a group of architects and artists and carpenters that were uh, in Guimarães, they were in the north of Portugal doing a capital of uh, culture. And they did this installation that you can see uh, in the picture uh, on the top. So from, from this huge installation with uh, wood, there was a big artistic uh, curated by a Portuguese uh, guy. It was really, really a very interesting moment of reunion in uh, Portugal with different artists and people really uh, got together in this place. 
And then when it got over, because the exhibition uh, went to the end, when it was end ended, this uh, collective of artists, they decided to bring the wood south to, to Lisbon. Uh, they were here, they wanted to experiment something new with this wood. And that's why the, the power of temporary projects, they are really catalysts to kickstart several projects. So when they come south, they build a temporary project in the, in the beach, in a fisherman's village, and they build this Casa do Vapor that uh, uh, got reunited over 200 uh, people from everywhere in the Europe. And this really created a uh, strong network. It's really funny, this uh, image that you showed before in Darmstadt, uh, because actually uh, this collective that was in, uh, in uh, Portugal was Construct Lab. So uh, it's, they were also involved in this Darmstadt project that you, uh, that you showed uh, before. So when, when, this, uh, when we meet these artists, we understand that there is a different way of uh, practicing architecture and it really is a, uh, a very important beginning for us because we were able to participate in their project and then because they couldn't stay longer in, Portug in Portugal, we uh, reused the wood for the third time and we were able to kickstart the project that you see in the image below. So actually these woods, they are uh, the result of a traveling. It's the third time that we use the, the, same, uh, the same wood. Um, so basically, because we met this, uh, this collective, it really gave us uh, the way of uh, practicing and the importance of uh, engaging with uh, the community and, and to use their knowledge to inform the, the program. So this, the kitchen that you see in the, in the picture below, uh, the biggest goal was to bring water to this community that had really, really, they have really living poor, poor conditions. And um, because of uh, this uh, uh, process that we started with them, we were able to design a community center that made sense to this uh, community because we listened to what program what were the needs of, uh, of the people. So they needed a place to, to eat, they needed a place to wash clothes. And basically, we, we, because we were in the field during a one year long process, we were, we were able to design with the information of what made sense to, to propose and to build there. Then we got also their engagement uh, and their participation in the building of it, which uh, allows to, to have some transforming decisions that are made on site. And this is the, the experimentation part that we have in our collective is that often we design something at the office, but then uh, locally, it makes sense to change it somehow and to adapt it to a reality, a different reality. So we strongly believe that uh, uh, it, it's much better to, to be on the, on the field and to share uh, these moments of listening so it can inform better the, the design. Of course, it's the architects that design in the end, but uh, um, it's, it's, uh, it's better with the participation uh, process. Um, sorry, can I? You okay? Yeah, yeah, what, why can I cannot pass for the next, next image? I don't know, should we try again? It's, yeah. no, there's no big worry. I like that. I like the synergy, though, the, the idea that obviously because Galway was capital of culture this year. So here we are talking about you know, a, a synergy from eight years ago with, with, with the Portuguese offering. So. Yeah, exactly. This was 2013. And then the kitchen was one year uh, building process. So 2014. And actually, uh, because it won a, a prize of uh, building of the year from Art Daily, uh, this brought visibility to, to the project and um, also uh, this was really important because we, um, we tried with this process to have better relation and to, to, be, to, to work as mediators um, between the municipality and the community. So architects really can be in this uh, mediating um, position and because 
the, the relationship was really bad with the municipality. Uh, the police interventions were really hard. And because of this process, it was, better, it was um, possible to repair and to, to create a, a better connection. And then, because of this, we started to work on a rehousing uh, participated process. And, um, well, this, the goal was to uh, have rehousing of uh, 200 people. And we were exploring a, a little bit like uh, Elemental um, did, and, and, and they, they proposed um, habitation uh, housing that is possible to expand if families expand. So we were interested in proposing a local office with, uh, with us working uh, on, on site to, um, to design a new neighborhood that would be chosen. And we did one year uh, more uh, uh, participation process with uh, the same community to choose what was the possible four sites um, that we could work with the municipality. Uh, in this in these sites, we uh, would be possible. It would be possible to design a full neighborhood with uh, inputs from uh, this community and to adapt the houses to the the local needs. Uh, then, unfortunately, because there was a shift in the municipality uh, party, then the full process got uh, uh, it was not possible to to continue. But we designed the, the neighborhood with the, with the inputs and with the needs of uh, this community. And of course, this is uh, much better than the conventional rehousing processes where people are just spread around the territory and then it uh, ruins all the, all the interrelations of help that people uh, have. Uh, so the irony there, of course, is that politics got in the way of a very yeah. progressive process that you were developing here. Yeah, after two years, uh, we were really starting uh, to, to have this possibility of a big rehousing process with participation. But then it was, unfortunately, it was not possible because there was this political uh, change. Okay. Um, then this uh, second slide, because uh, the, our proposal was to talk about uh, participation without building and participation with building. So uh, in this, uh, I, I bring an example of participation without building, which was after this community kitchen, we thought it was important to discuss about rehousing processes and how conventional they are nowadays and they don't really work. At least in Portugal, it works really, really bad. Because as I, I was saying, people are just, relocated in the houses that are available and then it getifies a lot the the neighborhoods and creates lots of problems so we organized through a european grant we organized a an event that was a two-day event one day with the conferences with guests from all over europe to uh, show examples of uh, good rehousing processes with the uh, participatory processes and then a second day uh, with, and the goal of the second day was to have a working session with uh, inhabitants, uh, public technicians that work in institutions related to rehousing, architects and politicians. And the interesting fact is that no one was identified. So nobody knew who was who. And this is the best way of uh, breaking all the difficulties that people are afraid to talk about a topic because they know that it's a politician or something very intelligent. And people are much more uh, uh, comfortable when they are not identified. So people only had their name on, the, on their uh, shirts and this was the, the best thing to work uh, as, a, as a group. So um, in, this, uh, in this case, the big goal was to, to promote this uh, inclusive process of discussing uh, rehousing possibilities. And, and in the end, we, we, we have a document that uh, we can share after that has all the results and all the proposals that we're able to make in one day uh, in four uh, specific topics that we prepared before. And um, have, you have you managed to capitalize on that in terms of to, well, to get that into any form of policy. 
not uh, we were able through a one of the politicians that were uh, there in in the end they she she said thank you for the invitation it was really interesting now i know that i need to go back to the parliament and propose rehousing as a fundamental right we hadn't seen the question from that perspective before so actually there was a a a uh, um, a bouncing effect or there was a consequence from uh, this uh, this uh, this project that was funded by the europe but um well we actually we were not able yet to make a rehousing process with the uh, uh, as as designers as architects this is a little bit our our dream so but we strongly believe that this type of events it's the first step to 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 make that uh, city city development policies uh, must be discussed by by not not only by politicians but they must involve technicians and also inhabitants and they have to involve citizens so it's a citizen uh, process and uh, well it it worked really really good as a, as an experience for a uh, to discuss a public uh, topic then a, an example with, with building uh, so this uh, project we made last year in a public square in the in the center of lisbon and uh, it's uh, a, a community with the old older an older population uh, there was a factory that uh, gave jobs for a, a lot of people there and um, kids used to play a lot in this square that had lots of shadow and some nice trees and the playground. And then there was a public program in Lisbon to renovate uh, the squares. And it was supposed to be a public uh, participation process. But, but then in this case, there was uh, fake participation somehow. So it was uh, over, uh, well, it, it wasn't made as a participatory process so they just uh, cemented everything and they removed the playground and they removed the trees so it was a big shock for the community and they got really angry and then because there was cultural technicians on site uh, working through collecting photos uh, working with collective memory and uh, well working really in proximity with these people uh, the cultural department of the municipality understood that they had to react and they had to propose something interesting for uh, this place because the situation was really, really tense. So they invited us to uh, make, or to propose an artistic installation that would involve people in the construction. So we, kn we knew that the photos were being collect collected by these technicians and this was really the connecting uh, point somehow. So what we proposed was to build this arch, which is composed by 150 benches. And on the, each top of uh, each bench, there is a photograph of uh, the memory of uh, this community. So people really identify themselves with, uh, with the artwork because one, they built the bench, so they participated in the, in the result uh, of the global thing. And um, well, and, and then it was really an exciting moment and the, the benches, then there, it was dismantled after three weeks and the benches uh, stood in this community. And now because of this uh, new way of uh, working and involving uh, us and uh, cultural technicians from the municipality. Now there is uh, uh, conditions to to be able to propose a new project to bring back the shadow. So now we we already uh, uh, we we designed the proposal and it's already on the table on their side to decide if it's going to be made or not. Um, to um, develop well th three small objects and this is a. Uh, it's, uh, I want to, after in the question when we'll be debating, I really want to get your perspective on the difficulty that it, that it exists. Um, how to uh, make a proposal 
uh, that should be uh, the designed with the inputs from people, but then the institutional clients, they want to see a, a drawing. They want to see already a shape. They want to see something. But then we say uh, that we want that the design is the result of uh, people's wishes. So it's a little bit, um, it's, re it's really hard. So we need to find strategies to propose modular things or uh, uh, adaptable uh, uh, designs because it's it's um, uh, it's a, 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 a counter sense you say in English it's um, it doesn't make any sense to propose a final design for something that needs participation for its shape and for its use and for its function of course it's a contradiction isn't it it's to, a, a to, total to contradiction whole, whole method and process how long how long was this project um, in terms of its 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 starting in, in terms of the exercise of working with the community to completing it uh, th this arch project yes the arch yeah it, it was uh, during uh, uh, one one week the the building actions and then the the artistic installation stood there for three weeks and then when we dismantled it's the picture that you see below we did a big uh, uh, dinner uh, in the street and people got back together using the benches uh, for a uh, kind of a barbecue. We do a lot of barbecues in uh, Portugal in the street. So the actually, so the artistic installation had already this uh, intention that in the end, the benches are dismantled, but they stay in the community. They were spread in the restaurants, in people's houses, in stores. And, and actually there is a, an idea on the table to reunite the benches again and to make another celebration, another moment, and to rebuild the arch again. That's a lovely story and a, and a great legacy. Um, thank you so much, Sebastian. Could, could I ask thank you to you. stop sharing your screen so I can... Of I, I'm just thinking, Mari, that four weeks, uh, that's kind of dream for you in terms of consultation, given that it was what, eight years for, and, and, and ongoing, of course. Yeah, um, so could, could you maybe sketch out the, the, the Grange town conversation to us so that people sure. can understand how long that that really has been sure i mean just while i'm opening up as well just, i just wanted to ask sebastio who had first got in touch with you in the last project and what they expected of you because i think that that idea of who is it that recognizes that some intervention has to be made but what do they expect of you as an architect coming in i'd be really interested to to hear a bit more about that as well you mean for the, for the shadow uh, yes yeah, for the shadow um, uh, so, sorry, the, the question. The question is, um, who who brought you into that project, and well, it, what did it, they expect it, of you, or what brief did they give you? So, uh, who brought us is the cultural technicians from the cultural department of the municipality, and because they are still working uh, uh, since two years ago in proximity with uh, with people and working with this photography uh, collection of the collective memory and they organized a uh, film, they, they are shooting a movie to, to uh, tell the story of this neighborhood. And then there is this intention of making a public event to show the result of this movie and to show the result of all these small actions that uh, they, they've been promoting uh, in this square. So because of this process, that's why they, they, they thought it, it would be interesting to start a, a participatory process to define the shadow. So actually, at this moment, we don't know uh, how big it will be, uh, in what kind of uh, material it will be, because uh, uh, unfortunately, because of uh, the, the pandemic situation, we, we, we cannot uh, continue on the streets working with, uh, with this community. And, uh, through through Zoom, actually, it's it's really hard because this type of uh, processes they really need presence. They need the con the human contact. Uh, well, at least for us, we really uh, believe that it's well. We we until now we didn't find the the solution how to work via Zoom with this type of uh, uh, communities. So the the process is is ongoing. It's still it's still uh, um, a thought to to be able to produce and to to uh, concrete uh, concrete uh, to make in uh, 2021, 
um, but it will need this this time and this presence to discuss uh, what what is the real need of this shade, how big, and uh, what what more activities can we include because a shade can be much more than just a shade. It's interesting, so this, Mari, because this it's, is um, what we want to discover exactly. Yeah, it's interesting, Mari, because it's a uh, it's a little bit like the, the point I was raising from the last conversation where. You know, no project seems to start at the beginning and nothing's ever linear. And I think it's quite interesting what Sebastio is describing through his three different processes that actually you're, you're, you're almost constantly sailing. You're tacking left, right mm -hmm. to, to find the wind to then reposition your, your course. And that's, that's, that, that's maybe something you can empathize with, Mari. Yeah, so is the, is the screen sh sharing okay? Yes, it is. It's great. Great. Thanks. Great. Um, so, yes, yeah, just to, I think just to introduce my role in this and the way I'm coming into this conversation. Um, as Nell mentioned, I've got a background in practicing architecture, um, both in Chicago and London, and had worked on private residential and social housing projects and at various scales. Um, but I just got to the point where I got really fed up with the agency I held as an architect. I, I always felt that we were coming into projects far too far down the line when all the key decisions had already been made and got frustrated with the fact that we could never really hang around um, afterwards either. Um, so went into academia and, um, and started to develop um, Community Gateway as a partnership platform. It works across Cardiff University and it collaborates with communities in Grangetown in Cardiff um, and has been doing so since 2012. And really it made a sort of commitment to, to stick around in one place um, long term and to spend a long time listening. So, this first slide is from the first conversation we held when we first proposed that we make a long-term commitment to working with one neighbourhood. Um, and one resident advised us that if we were going to do anything like that, we should be prepared to embark on a relationship and not an affair. And this really resonated with me because I think, feel like as a profession, we, we often have so little time to really get to know a place before we propose actions that will have a really significant impact. Um, but we also really get to stick around to understand the consequences of our actions. And I felt that both as an architect and as an educator. So this helped to make us make a case to the university that we should commit to a long term. Um, initially, it was 10 years. I'm now working on a commitment for 99 years. And we do have a commitment to sit on a charitable board for a 99 year lease term. Um, but really sort of emphasizing the, the need to give us all time. Um, to first get to know each other, um, to listen to each other, to observe, to learn to value what was there already before proposing to take any action. Um, so since 2012, all of my sort of roles in the university, teaching, research, administration, so on, have all been focused in this one neighbourhood of 20,000 residents um, in, within Cardiff. And all of the students I've worked with have also sort of engaged in the project. And it, it does separate between the architect as a professional and the role that the students play, um, which I could, I could talk about a bit more. Um, this, this is work by one of our students and it's an effort to make visible the efforts of many. Um, it tracks email, um, emails around the Grange Pavilion, which is the one small building that uh, Niall's, Niall's already shown, um, with one small group of residents proposing to take a vacant building on and to do something about it and not being quite sure how to proceed. And this proposal took um, place in a sort of wider UK context in which local councils were devolving civic assets and civic services to local community groups and actively encouraging community groups to step up and take over these services. And this, of course, is a really enormous undertaking. And it's not the sort of typical client that we would work with as a, as a professional architect. Um, you know, normally you'd be working with a client, who, at least on sort of a, a civic scale, who had experience or had mechanisms in place to be able to work through this but this was a group of residents who really didn't have any access to funding didn't have any access to larger support services and approached the university um, to come in as an institutional partner and support them um, but i think this this slide was really just about showing the value of the time and the value of the effort that it takes um, to do a participatory process so tracking three years of emails as the project grows as it stalls, as it hits challenges, um, moments where it starts to gain momentum, the intensity around planning events. So you can start to see in this email trail where it sort of jumps up around various parties and um, big public events and then sort of drops back down again as everyone gets burnt out and exhausted and hits the challenges of administrative work and so on. And I think just sort of making visible 
the things like you know the fact that it took 14 community meetings 58 meetings um, across one year so more than one meeting a week 495 emails from one person alone um, so i think just starting to recognize how much goes into this process and starting to identify the gaps for support in processes like this and then this third slide to start to capture um, the growth of that process and the stage that we're currently at um, so on the lower right hand side um, a building that's now completed externally. Um, it's still sort of, we're still working on it internally, but we also see it as the beginning rather than the end of a project. Um, and this is really about sort of being able to stick around and understand the consequences of our actions, but be able to adjust the building as um, as work sort of keeps going. Um, one of the things I loved about Sebastian's presentation is this sort of impact of temporary projects as well. So we've had eight years in which we began with one day pop ups, one day ideas, picnics. Um, a temporary storytelling booth in which we started to gather stories and we started to understand our role as architects, um, not as designing a building at the beginning, but as helping a community start to build together. So a community is starting to form the resources and the capacity to take on the building themselves. And so a sort of series of pop-up events, temporary events, fast and visible and cheap events, and then that's sort of slowly growing as an evidence base for a larger scale of funding to be able to deliver um, what ended up being a 1.9 million pound building. Um, we sort of almost see ourselves as going back to the beginning again now, because now that we have this building as a sort of house for, for our actions, we now start inhabiting it. We now start reaching out um, across the neighborhood from it. So I think it, it, it's that sort of sense of the building itself not being the object that we finish with, but it starts to become the house for our collective actions. And I think unlike any other project I've ever been involved with, um, it's been a, it's a really insightful process to understand how much has gone into the process before the professional architectural team got on board, how many organisations, how many institutions had started to come together to be able to put together the programme to make the building work, and then how much work goes on after the architect um, leaves the room, as it were. So this real interest in sticking around to see the consequences of our participatory actions um, and to see where that's going to lead us you know, in the next year, the next 10 years, and the next 99 years as our, as our um, commitment to a lease starts to um, tick down towards the end of that lease. It's a really, yeah, I, don't, I have to say I have a huge amount of admiration for you, Mari, the, the way you've kind of been able to stuck at it, but, uh, but surely, surely there must have been periods of which you, you hit the wall and there's massive fatigue or almost a sense of um, the project derailing itself or hitting hitting the buffers from time and time through different funding cycles. How, how, how have you managed that? I think um, the, the idea of these frequent events has really helped us. So if I go back to the previous slide, um, you know, there, there are moments where we hit rock bottom and where everyone almost gives up. And because we were in, you know, in the one hand, we were on this a very long bureaucratic cycle of just how long it takes to get some of these processes through a council and through the legalities of asset transfer leases and so on. But we also had an academic cycle. And so I think the role of the, of the university in this was really key because I always had a group of students coming in. I always had a group of students coming in sort of fresh and energetic and committed to doing something. And we were able to hold an annual party and each party um, brought in a new group of people. And so this idea of sort of like building momentum. So even though we had a core group of people running throughout, when we sort of start to get to the point where we were all getting burnt out, we'd get a new group of people coming in. And as we started to take on um, you know, events from a one day pop up to then a three year residency, we were all also able to start bringing in institutional support from other organizations. And they sort of were able to bring in their own layers of expertise. And so I don't think any of us started the project thinking it would end up being the scale that it ended up being. It ended up being that scale because to viably support itself, it had to grow and it had to have enough bookable space to be able to support a development manager and so on in the space. Okay, so that's but, interesting, um, though, isn't it? Because that, that moves away from the kind of, um, the, the, sort of the benevolent model of trying to help a community to actually the commercially resilient model where you're having to really make it stack up. There's a kind of, what, what point is the tipping point made where you're moving from one phase to the next? When I think when we, when we got to the point where we were convinced that the building could work in that there was enough interest. So going into a vacant building, being able to test it out on site, being able to 
um, pilot lots of activities, lots of which failed. I mean, it gave us room to, to fail really fastly, uh, or really fast as well. So being able to test things out, fail, from, um, fail and learn from them, and then test something else out until we start to find something that's stuck. Once we had a core group of people who knew that their activities were working in that space, and we could start to go to funders. Um, I think a tipping point for us was to start talking to um, our, our key funder, big, um, big Lottery Fund, um, and um, the Big Lottery Fund in Wales. And they um, brought in, they, they've, sh they've shifted their funding model in that they don't want to fund buildings alone anymore. They fund the building capital, but they also fund revenue. And they're really invested in the idea that any building that's funded through them has to have resilience to be able to last over the long term. So as part of the funding cycle, once, once you're through the first hurdle, they bring in um, a development trust agency. And our first conversation with the development trust agency started to talk about sweating the asset. And that was sort of completely counter to everything we'd thought about because we'd always sort of thought about this as you know, a civic building, it was a community building, it wasn't going to make money, it wasn't about profit. And this idea of somehow having to think really economically and about sweating the asset took us completely out of our comfort zone. But we started to sort of realise through, through that conversation and then through visiting other community asset transfers that it had to be something that could sustain itself. And I think that's when we started to sort of reach out to other organisations to join the, the charitable incorporated organisation who now run it um, to make sure that that the building could fund itself and so that the principle that it runs under is that two-thirds of the building is always funded out for bookable space but there's always a third of the use reserved for free community use by community members yeah it's and a difficult it's a difficult thing because there's the tension there isn't there that you're you're always having to kind of again navigate through the gaps between the needs of the community which is incredibly diverse in grange town to actually something where it just needs to see be seen to be at least covering itself let alone you know, the maintenance and all of the other aspects that probably come with the building of that scale. Okay, could I ask you to, thank you so much, can I ask you to maybe stop sharing? Because I think it's, uh, it, it leads me neatly on to you, Daisy, because of course, um, the great phrase of relationship, not an affair, but the nature of work you're doing, here's Mari doing this one long relationship. Are you having multiple affairs or multiple relationships with your clients? Because there, there, there are many, and you're, you're obviously doing many different types of projects. Can you expand? Uh, yes, it's true. I'll bring up my slides. But I think because I'm not an architect and so and my work is quite process based, although it intersects with architecture, I do end up getting repeat commissions with in the same places. So oddly, you do end up building quite a long term relationship with people, but you keep popping up because you get rehired by a different practice or rehired by um, the same local authority to work in the same place with a different practice. Um, so it does allow you a longer term relationship. I'll just share my slides. So I've slightly broken the format. I've got um, six slides, but they're kind of three slides. It's just the three phrases and then three images of projects that come after them. And um, it's interesting going last because there are lots of themes that have come up that I think resonate here. But yeah, what I've started, I'm a non-architect who works predominantly in architecture um, but not always in architecture but everything I do is about supporting groups of people to take decisions about what happens to a piece of space but that might be creating a piece of policy or creating a brief and, and sometimes a community in an area will ask me to work with them directly sometimes I'll work for an architect sometimes for a local authority for the government um, so at the risk of coming over all like motivational pinterest quotes um i've just i've just picked out that i've got three phrases three um quotes that i come back to all the time particularly when i'm feeling a bit depressed about as, as mari said like the agency that architecture um can actually have that keep me going um and they're very much they frame the approach that i take to participatory work and uh, so one is this i'm just always making the point that participation is a form of politics not a form of pr which is it's sad that you have to make but i think so many people who do the job i do which sometimes gets called you know a community consultation consultant or participation consultant fundamentally come from the world of comms and pr and the, there's a kind of idea there and you know, Sebastian's project about people sort of knowing what they want to happen on the square in the first instance and doing something that then his team had to come in and uh, remedy some broken trust as a result of the initial token participation. Um, you know, this quite often happens that participation is seen as a way of getting people on board, 
do a nice event, invite people along, convince them of the merits of the, of the thing that you wanted to do anyway, uh, the minute that you saw the site or owned the site. And so I'm always very clear that participation is politics, it's a process of working out, and this is a, a really classic definition of politics from Harold Laswell, a, a political scientist from the early 20th century. Politics is who gets what, when, how. And fundamentally, my job is about designing processes that make that transparent, who gets what, when, how, rather than hiding it under nice sounding phrases and images, but then actually trying to maximise the space where people with fewer conventional forms of power, so people who may not be in political office, who may not have much money, and who may not own the land, do get um, to be part of these decisions. Um, this is the second one. This massively affects how I go about designing the nature of processes themselves. So it's from another political theorist, Chantal Mouffe, um, still living. And she stresses in talking about you know, what democracy is and, and why we cannot, why we should never aim for consensus, because even though consensus, rational consensus, is a lovely idea that if we all got together in a room, we could all agree in the end on a perfect solution and then implement it. And she's very clear that no, democracy um, accepts, or it should accept, that things could always be otherwise, and therefore every order, everything we design or put into the world is predicated on the exclusion of other possibilities. And consensus type work tries to ignore the fact that you've excluded all the other possibilities. So she has this lovely concept of agonism, which is a form of positive conflict. And the idea that you do acknowledge that people have different desires, needs, values, identities in a room. And rather than try to smooth them all over, you need to um, support a world where you can agree to be positive antagonists and to debate these things and accept that not everybody will come out 100% happy, but that you're constantly reinventing, making, producing the world together. And, and so that would very much how I would try to set up process is working in a very deliberative way so that people are able to put these things on the table and then we can tease our way through and of course architecture does have to produce in some ways you know a solution a fixed form at a certain point um but nonetheless obviously a building becomes inhabited at that point it doesn't freeze at, um it was you know interesting hearing sebastian talk again about this idea of like the mo potentially modular emerging things how do you not kind of fit the image of the thing you're going to design but allow for something to emerge and then yeah it's funny yeah so Mari talking about being an architect and then leaving architecture because of um, realizing how constrained your agency is um, and yeah I'm a non-architect who's ended up in architecture but then quite often feels oh, I'm glad I'm not an architect precisely because of that a fair type position that you get put in at a point in the process you arrive but I do teach a lot of young architects at UCL uh, a lot of, and I teach them the history and theory of spatial politics and participation and I always come back to this one and I encourage you know, I, I never want them to leave the course feeling oh being an architect it's so hopeless so this is uh, Michel Foucault the political philosopher in an interview basically he spent the whole interview talking about how what a restricted amount of power architects have and the interviewer base then says well what can architects do? And then he really emphasizes this. No, architecture can and does produce positive effects when the liberating intentions of the architect coincide with the real practice of people in the exercise of their freedom. And I think that's at the nub of good participatory practice, really understanding how, what is it that actually people want to practice that your abilities to understand and form space can support and how can you produce and space and shape space in a way that allows that freedom to be exercised and that is possible and you know i mean the project we just seen with mari you know you can work in certain ways that do enable that and share the agency that you do have and prolong the agency of others so the three projects i've got here this is from my own practice i see that i no longer have but i used to have with three architects a community center in um, Nunhead in South London. Um, this was one of the most traditionally political projects I've ever been involved in, in that here we were working with a community who um, were very, came from a position of anger and frustration and need. They were very upset they'd lost an old community center. Um, they were being offered what they thought was a poor replacement, uh, along with a lot of housing on the site. And we were initially the architects brought in to do the housing 
that they didn't want, not the community centre that they did want, which was being done by in-house local authority architects. Uh, despite the fact they didn't want our housing, um, we managed to have quite a relationship of trust with them because they realised we were doing our very best to make the housing work for them. And so we were given the whole commission of the community centre too. And it was a lovely project because it was a proper co-design project. Basically, the council said, here's the budget. We need to base sign off the programme so it's not completely crazy, you know, what's going to be happening in the building. But fundamentally, the community can take all the decisions. They can be the client. But the other part of the deal was they will need to run and manage the centre. We just don't have the capacity anymore to fund community centres of this kind. So the community said, good deal. So it was a wonderful project working with them. But going back to that final point of Mari's conversation with you, Niall, we were, they were designing the business plan and we were designing the architecture hand in hand. So literally the architecture becomes an extrusion of their business plan. But their business plan is then coming out of participatory work that's happening alongside ours that we're supporting to work out, you know, what does the community as a whole need? How can we find ways to subsidise the activities they want to offer for free by designing spaces they could hire out for more um, but it's it's a, been open for a few years now happily running seems very well used um, uh, so that's the first one the second project that relates to that is a project with other architects Adam Khan architects and Muff architecture um, and this is a classic one of negotiating multiple desires um, I mean here we are working on the site of demolished social housing ready to rebuild new housing we're working with the former residents in this picture um, it's a classic estate regeneration project uh, knock down the social housing that's there and rebuild at double the density to get better quality new social housing but also you have to have private housing and shared ownership housing to subsidize it so we had a really delicate balance to work here of working with residents who were coming back to make sure that we retained what was important to them uh, what uh, yeah, this young lady here is doing we were collecting the remaining bits of people's like home decor that were in rubble on the site in order to be able to keep those and maybe bring those um, back in some ways but to work with them to honor their memories uh, to work to make something that the community in this area of Hackney as a whole felt worked well on the site because it's a very visible site. This is a very kind of famous church here and there's an amazing park that runs off to the side. So lots of people very into the conservation area nearby and the architecture, but also the major population in this area is Orthodox Jewish, um, very traditional. And we knew that most of the new housing would be occupied by Orthodox Jewish families because they were that's who's on the waiting list for much of the housing and that's also who wants to buy in the area um, but th there's a tension between the Orthodox Jewish community in this area and other people including non-Orthodox Jewish people because I mean it's, it's a spectacular if you go and look but most of the Orthodox Jewish families just flout the planning system in, in ways that are understandable when you understand they're trying to hold massive families in houses that were designed for small families and um, so there's a lot of illegal extensions which Hackney Council you know kind of turns a blind eye to because they understand the cultural need for it but really annoys other people who feel why you know what's the planning system for so the whole process had to kind of mediate that but also to design homes for orthodox jewish families that we knew they could live in and that would honor the strict religious needs of the house but that a family who wasn't orthodox jewish could move into um, so we had lots of different events that were about with individual communities trying to bring communities together trying to honor everybody's needs and a very agonistic process in that way and that is now that has planning permission so is now being built and then the final project uh, this really relates to something you said Sebastian this is a with my, again with my practice AOC um, a participatory exhibition and research and engagement space for the welcome collection which is a big kind of health slash arts organization in London near Euston Station and they wanted a new gallery that would allow different forms of engagement with their collection and actually this was one where the, it was a competition and the competition asked for a design proposal and we did just go in saying we're not showing you a design proposal we're showing you a process because if you want a different form of participation um, you're only going to get that through working with your users to work out what that might be and so for this I became a brief builder in residence um, at 
this gallery and we ran all kinds of we we're given a space and we were allowed to run all kinds of public experiments with different objects working out what people would and wouldn't do and wanted to do and couldn't couldn't do existing things and then that formed the brief for this gallery that was then designed and and, and that's like a whirlwind daisy there's so much to take in from that from that from that portfolio <laughs> so I went quite quickly <laughs> don't worry it's fine i think i think we're okay we you know we, it's a live event but obviously people can be picking this up on the youtube channel later um, I, I th there's so much to take in from that, but I suppose for me the, the, the word sort of agitator came out of this. It's something sometimes we use as a term when we're talking about the process of kind of nudging and poking at, at, at problems and also trying poking at sort of ways of trying to find that consensus. It's a very difficult role. You're, you're kind of both, are you both playing bad cop and good cop in, the, in these situations? Um. Uh, maybe. I mean, I do think it's important that those of us who do have, like, I think it's important that all of us in any way in the world, not just in architecture, are conscious of the agency that we do have. And then that we use that to try and widen space for others. So yes, in some ways, and that, then you have to keep poking at the boundaries because there are so many ways in which, you know, we, we live or we make space that do seem that their power relations are slightly askew so yes but but only in a in a positive and constructive way i mean and i think architects in general are always told like challenge the brief aren't they i mean that's one of the things you get taught in architecture school like, in absolutely I, I suppose what, what, what i'm asking is whether this is a this is a very sort of um, passive process or whether it's quite active in the sense of are you trying to uh, almost appear like you're not making people make decisions or are you physically sort of and consciously explaining to them that they need to make certain I'd, well I think, i'd say the most common thing i encounter and, and kind of why i ended up doing what i do is actually people the first thing anyone really wants to know the minute you start a participatory process is what genuine influence have i got in this and how are the decisions taken and i'd say the, my obsession with that is not something i was born with it's come from 20 years of doing this work and thinking yeah damn right that's the important thing and that's what we've got to make clear and then you can decide if you're happy with that if you want to participate in that if you want to push to have more um but i i'd say and i think in london at the moment i don't know what it's like in ireland but um yeah i think this, this research has shown we've got such tremendous levels of distrust in both developers and local authorities in terms of regeneration and development that i'd say that decision making obsession is bigger than ever. I spend a lot of time drawing decision making charts to help make things constructive. Mari, you can probably relate to that. I suppose, you know, the decision making process was complex, um, you know, through having to gain trust in Grangetown. It's a very diverse community. How long did it take you to, to kind of settle that process into, in, in, into an understanding of trust? We, so looking back on it, we thought that we took about three years to get to the point where we felt we'd settled into something and we had a, you know, a course of agreement between a group of people who had started to define a common vision. But that, that was a sort of three year process of lots of testing out and lots of um, you know, going off in different directions before we all started to settle into something. And we've, we've sort of come across that from, from other, um, other publications and so on. We, um, we were looking at Participatory City as a research publication in, um, coming out of Lambeth. And they also sort of identified this sort of three years of listening before you take any action. And so, so certainly, you know, I think that kind of cycle of going through a, a few years um, uh, before, we, before we move forward. But one of the things I think I wanted to pick up from both Sebastian and Daisy was, you know, the, the push to get um, architectural students really really interested in policy and business plans because that's where a lot of the the decision making um, and the power and the impact sits and so applying creative skills towards those aspects that can be seen as mundane or that can be seen as upstream and as not part of the architectural agenda but i think also for for me as the budget holder and the client in this job so we, we were sort of client working with an architect um it, it was also really eye-opening to me to find out how little agency I had even as a budget holder because processes just take over and so I think particularly mm. in the UK there are so many people at the table in any project there are so many 
the legislative and bureaucratic processes that have to be signed off and the, pro the process can almost completely take over from the, the pursuit of something of quality itself. So you know, we would sit through endless meetings um, because we were working across different organizations and so on and we had to report back to them. You could sit through a year of meetings with a group of people who were making decisions about a building without them ever having looked at a set of drawings. Um, because to them, you know, the, the, the building itself wasn't the thing. It was the, you know, the accountability of where the funds were going and things like that. So I think this sort of like real push to try and make sure that at some point everybody cared about the building and cared about the project as a piece of architecture and as something of, of quality that we were pursuing because you, you could just get completely excited by ticking all the boxes and you know nobody who sort of ticked the boxes ever sort of having real care about what you were ending up with. Uh, Sebastian, if I can bring you in here because you, you, you've obviously been quiet for a wee while, but uh, the, the, the second project you showed, uh, participating without the building, was really pulling on, I think, what, what, what um, Mari's talking about. The, I, a, the politics of it, but secondly, this idea that people were almost ignorant that there was an alternative way of thinking about providing you know, choice and the mechanism of who gets what within the housing model. Um, what was the what was the re relationship like with the with the regional um, authority or the municipality by the time you complete, completed this work? Well, uh, we we invited, uh, for instance, uh, a technician that uh, is responsible to um, to relocate and to make the administration of uh, who gets what kind of uh, house, and uh, then during the the working sessions to to see to see that uh, the inhabitants uh, well some of them they they really didn't know that this person was uh, this technician and uh, when when they discussed about uh, uh, these um, uh, methods of uh, how how uh, people are ch are chosen the the choosing process of who gets what kind of house it's uh, it's nobody. It's really a secret somehow. Nobody really knows what's behind the choosing uh, process. And uh, to see that there was a, a confrontation uh, during the 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 event, uh, and then yeah, in in the end there there was no really uh, um, well um, um, how, to, how to how to explain. There was there was no. Um, uh, continuation to this uh, to this uh, problem. Well, there was a, a confrontation, but then there was no. Um, well, in the end, there was this. Uh, um, I'm, I'm having. It's okay. I, I think I, I understand you, what you're saying because it, it really relates to this issue of trust. That actually, when things aren't understood or explicit. It becomes incredibly difficult to follow. Daisy, you're, you're, you're sort of, you were alluding to that at the start, weren't you? That the fact that people are facing up to you to say, you know, who's in charge here and who has the agency, and you're sort mm -hmm. of holding the cards at that point. How do, you, how do you navigate that? Or how do you politically navigate it, given the sensitivities, especially when you've got such rich kind of cultural sensitivities on some of the sites you've worked on? Um they negotiate people wanting to know who holds the cards. Yeah, but also that the, effectively going back to the quote about politics, the idea of you yeah. know, how, how do you kind of all, either depoliticize or politicize the process in order to, to, to give agencies to community? Well, I think it, it is partly about making the decision making process explicit so that people have an understanding from the start about where it is that it's being suggested well, where they can influence things, because sometimes you can't. So we're really clear, if policy exists, we explain what policy is and that we can't change policy at this stage. But if you're annoyed about it, here's how you can change policy. So there's always that element of trying to feed people back up to where they can make a difference. But they're making clear where all the decisions are that can be taken, uh, where the space is to participate, but also encouraging people on those ones that are gray area, you know, where the client may be saying, there isn't enough money for that, or we never do that sort of, you know, that sort of space. But if it matters to people, then making it clear, well, we could, you know, we can push and scratch here. But I think, uh, and then a lot of what I do is about 
encouraging the architects themselves to be conscious about their decision making because I think in terms of the politics of design that's an interesting space because you get a lot of people it's very fashionable at the moment to work in participation and people saying that they're very into it but um, it, it can be very hard once you get your idea not to feel oh yes I got this idea from the community and, uh, and I think a lot of architects can be very reluctant to accept that design is a decision making process because you're encouraged to kind of, well, design is iterative and intuitive to a certain degree. Nonetheless, there are sign off points, things get put down on paper and things get built. So decisions are being made, even if they're less explicit and less conscious. And so a lot of what I do is just encouraging the architects to really think about how am I taking part in this negotiation process? Where is it appropriate that I actually respond with something and say, you've hired me to do this and I'm suggesting this is the right thing to do, trust me. And where is it appropriate to say, oh, hang on, maybe I'm caught with a bee in my bonnet about something I think is important, but listening to you, I, I really feel I need to reevaluate it. So it's not, I mean, it's far more kind of established people than me have made these arguments. But, you know, I mean, Jeremy Till, for instance, always talks about this idea of it's not about saying experts shouldn't exist architectural expertise is really important but it's being conscious of the way in which you deploy your knowledge and power as an architect just going back to where you began this question i think now and um, <laughs> by being conscious about it um then you can be both more architect and less architect as required Interesting. But Mari, obviously you then had this problem, didn't you, with, with, with Grangetown. I don't say it was a problem that I'm aware of, but you had to move from the role of being a facilitator to then engaging an architect to deliver a building. How did you, how did you mediate between those two issues? But also how did you, or did you learn anything in terms of getting rid of all of these people in the room or finding a different model of delivery that still met with the requirements of funders and all of the kind of regulatory processes. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, th I think first to say that we were probably really bad clients because we, we, were, we were a really loose group still when we started the building. And so we didn't have, you know, there was a sort of an evolving program and an evolving brief. And that was, sort of, I think one of the difficulties we found with the, with the, with the whole sort of growth of the process was uh, who was willing to stand up and make the decision because we were so democratic that at some point you know nobody wanted to be the person representing the community mm -hmm. and make that decision and so there were a couple of moments where we did have externals come in and sort of work with us and help us kind of narrow down um but we also we we sort of introduced the architects quite slowly so we had them in we, we had a, a number of different architects that um through various processes we had identified as possibly working with and then brought them in for different events and different party events and so on and got people to get to know them and, and sort of almost interview them without their knowledge um you know so, so getting to know them quite slowly and then went through a series of interviews and we recorded the interviews um to kind of unpick what the decision making had been and at one point somebody had said that um it's not about the visions it's about how they understand the us of us and they sort of almost took it for granted that any architect could deliver a building that was their expertise, that was the, the core expectation. What they were looking for was somebody who they could, um, they felt would sort of be comfortable talking to them, would understand where they were coming from and would understand what that community was about. And, um, and I think that that's sort of what tipped it in the end. So we, we worked with um, Dan Benham, architect, and they just sort of felt that they were somebody, he was somebody they could have a conversation with and who could have a conversation with almost anyone in the community. So that, that sort of separation almost of, somebody bringing the vision in as their professional expertise, but somebody who was willing to have, to show up on a Saturday morning and play football with the kids in the park um, was kind of a core thing for them. That, that feeling that um, there, was, there was a sort of extra layer of, of engagement that would come into that. It's also, I suppose, demystifying the professional role, isn't it? And actually making them more human, but also, you know, effectively part of that community. A little bit, I suppose, what's coming out in all of these conversations is about being embedded. And Sebastio, your, your, your last project was a lovely example of that, the idea that uh, you know, something so catastrophic in terms of a, a total lack of dialogue about the removal of trees and, and the changing of a park only and needed a start. conversation and a bit yeah. of participation to, to change that relationship. And can be the start of working differently with architects, the public technicians and the people. Uh, it's, a, it's a different way of uh, 
working. But I, I wanted to, to bring a, a topic that for us, it's a, it's a real difficulty. And I, I would like to say if uh, I'd like to know if in your practices, it's also a difficulty. It's the, fr the legal framework to be able to have public contracts with the participatory process, because it is so uh, un unconventional somehow that there is no, it's not drawn as a, uh, as a, uh, I, I wrote, the framework legal way to get paid always needs a kind of a trick or a, a prototype. It needs to be called differently uh, to be able to put in practice this pop-up events. Mm. Uh, it's always very hard to, to get uh, which, what, what should be uh, the new normal. And if we want to uh, be the, that these processes are a new uh, normal way of designing things, then uh, we, we need to, to change the whole system of the mm. public contracts because they are unprepared somehow. They, they don't know how to respond to this uh, uh, new way of engaging with people. And this for us, it's a real, real problem because we always are in this situation that we need to invent and to call this thing like a test prototype. You know, these names that we need to find and I, I really think that this is uh, the, the, the start of everything to make it a uh, uh, good practice, a normal good practice. And Daisy, you must encounter this because yeah. I know that, I know that yeah. all architects moan about frameworks and, and, the, and the process of bidding for work and, and this yeah. kind of normative behavior of how does it, how, how does it get... Um, well, I mean, I would say, I think it used to, it, so, I, mean, I mean, I only work in um, UK fundamentally, but, um, I think it used to be more of an issue than it is now. I, I think, uh, well, I mostly work public sector. So public sector in UK, actually now most uh, tenders, you know, mo they will be asking for engagement to be part of it. And there is the capacity to cost it. And that has shift. So that makes it a lot easier because there has been that culture shift. But I think it, in the past, so say 10 years ago, we, yeah, it was a real problem. And you know, you end up using up all your fee because actually those early stages are supposed to go quite fast. So we used to find tricks of like, not exactly tricks, but you know, we really have to argue this is a research stage and cost it research. And I, this isn't mine and I think it was quite genius. And Liza Fjord, um, who's uh, from Muffs, one of the practices I was with there, we've done a lot of projects together. And I remember we were doing one pitch where she was saying, how can, you know, how can we get the money we need for all that work we want to do, like mapping and that we know matters to the project. And she said, you know what? no one ever questions the section that says surveys you know if you say we need to do this survey and this survey and this survey they do it so i think we should just like call it community survey and then we can just put a sum next to it and i thought it was really clever it worked quite, it did seem to work quite well but that client was quite amenable anyway but i think the culture is changing here and people acknowledge it and they quite often say you need an engagement consultant on your team and therefore we get costed as a separate consultant anyway or if you've got one in-house you could then just you know if you're doing that service you could cost it so Murray, th th Murray, through your research because you're obviously doing you were doing some research some, some years ago about this whole process did, did you find a, a way of, of of changing the perception of procurement um through the gateway model yeah, I mean, from, from our point of view, we just we rewrote the procurement requirements um, within the bounds of what we could within. We were working within the university system and we were able to write the quality criteria. And again, this is where I sort of try and get students to get excited about this stuff, because because we could inv get involved with quality criteria, which normally is things like, um, you know, what's your annual turnover? How many employees do you have? How many BIM stations do you have? Um, we were able to start sort of asking architects about how they would engage with community, you know, sort of, um, what they're, how they would get to know the community. Um, and, you know, just, I think just sort of changing the expectations, both in terms of how we procured the architect and then similarly with the contractors, we were asking them for commitments to get to know community um, and building in, um, you know, th there were some expectations that they would, for example, host an artist on site and that artist was someone who worked with the contractors to bring them back to our house for cups of tea so that they felt like they were being treated like human beings on site and then they would actually start to take a bit more care with the project because they understood that it wasn't just a profit-driven project and in, um, in the same way as a lot of their other work so so i think it, it was just about sort of finding those those moments in lots of legal documents where it allows you to add in um, a, a different approach to value and just been able to open up conversations because of that and so because the the wording was a bit different and it stood out. It meant that during the procurement process, 
we opened up conversations about what quality and value meant. And from the first meeting with the contractors, um, we sort of really emphasized this idea that this was a community led project. And so we were, we were trying to pursue quality and that was a real shift in, in emphasis because normally it's about, you know, what's the lowest cost you can possibly achieve at the, in the, at the fastest rate. Mm. But being able to say from the outset, look, we know that there might be moments where, you know, the, the, the cost might rise or the you know, timing might be delayed, but we're, we're looking at a 99 year lease here and we're looking at a community group managing this facility long term. So can we, can we think really long term in the decision making? Yeah, and that's um, interesting because that brings me on, I suppose, to close out. So we are running well over time. But I suppose I'd like to just discuss very briefly legacy. Um, Daisy, what's what's what does success look like to you when you're when, you, when you're when you're working on a project and maybe returning to it a little bit like you did with your community centre? I guess that it's just being used, like in whatever form it ends up being used. You know, I mean, I think it's not not necessarily in the form that you imagined, um, although if it is, great, but yeah, it's coming. I mean, it, it's so, for me, I mean, for me, it's so simple. And I do stay in touch with a lot of the people that we work with. So yeah, just going back and people saying, oh, look, we're doing this, we're doing that. This, this works great. And it's stopping being a piece of architecture in that kind of sense. And just, it, it, it's just part of everybody's life. So no. I, suppose, I suppose the success is that you've, you've, you've given that community the agency and they've, they've, they've taken it and allowed them to understand the value in the building or the value in the space or whatever the actual... I, I guess that you've is. done that thing that Foucault, that you kind of hope, you know, Foucault says is possible. That would, be the, that would be the success. Yeah, that somehow in the little bit of moment that you had to mould and produce a bit of space into something else, you did manage to use those skills to provide something that has allowed people to exercise their freedom and yeah that would be the aim I, i'd love the idea of community reading of Foucault. that would be something else wouldn't it so sebastian what would you view as success with any of your projects well i, I would say that uh, a, pro, a, pro, a project has success when it's uh, not dependent of the promoter's energy if if uh, the promoters in the beginning if they do a uh, a good job, a good design, a good concept. If after, if it's adopted by the community, it will evolve naturally in the direction that people really want. And uh, we, we participated in 2015 in a, a capital of culture. It was in Mons in Belgium. And there was, a, there was a public park that was closed for 10 years. And then there was a proposal uh, from Construct Lab to uh, make a three-week three, three week residency uh, with artists and uh, architects and carpenters and we built the infra infrastructure, the basic infrastructures in this park uh, that was abandoned and, and then uh, people really wanted this park to be open so they started to uh, question what was, what, would ha what was happening, what kind of activities would happen there and then a group of uh, inhabitants, uh, they uh, started to make bread. They, they built, built a hoven to uh, cook bread every Sunday when we were there. So slowly, uh, people started to reuse the, uh, this park, this garden again. And um, with time, after one year, uh, of course, we, the residency was for three weeks of building and then six months of uh, artistic activities. But then when, when the project ended, um, because there was an association that was created to, to keep maintaining the, the park uh, with activities, uh, because of this uh, association, nowadays the park has lots of uh, activities. Uh, I really have to, show, uh, to share the link with you. It's called it's uh, in Mons, M-O-N-S, in Belgium. And uh, the project is called Mons Invisible, Mons Invisible. And the park is just uh, really, really beautiful. And uh, nowadays it's fully, fully uh, working with lots of uh, activities because there was uh, uh, a public investment from culture of the, uh, the amount is almost surreal when you think that the amount to be able to pull up this thing was 150,000 euros for a public intervention. Normally it's millions. 
yeah. when you think that a couple of thousand uh, are able to reactivate an abandoned place in the city, it's really ma amazing. Just because there is a energy, a catalyst uh, uh, activity that afterwards get, gets uh, evolved by the use of people. So this for me, it's the success. When you achieve this, it's because it worked and it was uh, a nice project. Great, that's so good of you. So could you, could you maybe pop that onto the uh, chat bar? Yeah, so that of you course. Share that? Mario, I'm going to close out with you, but I, I suppose we could say that you have been successful because you've delivered what you've set out to, to deliver. But maybe, maybe the fun has only just started. Yeah, um, I think the fun's only just started. I mean, yeah, for, for us, it's, it's, it's that the building is cared for and um, it's, it's loved and looked after. And so I think that there's this ongoing set of, you know, of activities just to start living in the building and start adjusting it to the way that it needs to start working. But I think it's always been seen as a catalyst as well. So th there's also a terror of our unintended consequences of the building. You know, what happens if it leads to gentrification? What happens if it's not welcoming to the um, groups of people that it's intended um, to be welcoming to? So I think this idea of um, sticking around to see what the consequences of our actions are, but also to help the building become a catalyst for similar types of action on a broader scale. So taking on some of the, the broader issues of, um, you know, uh, of housing in the area. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in greening streets and you know, sort of more walkable pedestrian livable city um, actions around it. So I think, I think sort of starting to move from that scale of the building up to a neighborhood of 20,000 people and trying to take the same, the same process um, over time. But there might also be lots of other smaller actions within the area. So, so I think just carrying on what we're doing. That's great. Taking the long view. Thank you, Mari. Thank you, Sebastian. And yeah, just, and just, just to, to say that I shared two links. Uh, actually, one uh, tells the story of the beginning of the project. And then the second link, uh, it's the actual uh, use. Nowadays, the association makes the the Facebook page with the activities. So you, you'll be able to see the life that exists now, that uh, it's much better than before, of course. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Um, Thank you very much. Really, really great conversation. And, and thanks for everybody else for sticking around for, for this extended version. We're back next week with um, Jess Fernie, uh, Lee Evert from Bax and Day Studio and uh, Alexander Roma from Construct Lab. So join us there next Thursday, 7.30. Thank you.